Welcome to Inspiring STEM's podcast program, celebrating innovations in scientific publishing and science communications. We're interviewing key opinionists on organizations working to advance and quite often to disrupt the status quo. My name is Martin Delahanty and I will be your host. In this week's episode, I'm chatting with Eleanor Huntington, Executive Director for Digital National Facilities and Collections at the Commonwealth Science, Scientific and Industrial Research Organization, CSIRO, which is Australia's national science agency. Prior to that, she was Dean of the College of Engineering and Computer Science at the Australian National University. Eleanor has also had board appointments with Innovation Science Australia, Significant Ventures, Questacon, and other government scientific advisory roles. In 2020, she was elected a Fellow of the Academy of Technology and Engineering, and in 2017 was named an Honorary Fellow of Engineers Australia. From 2017 to 2019, she led the extended group of eight engineering deans as the first female chair. A very warm welcome, Eleanor, to the program. Thank you very much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, so you're in Canberra, I'm in London, and we're, we're hopefully connected over the airwaves for a little bit. Uh, to begin, you're, you're an engineer by training and hold a PhD in experimental quantum optics and a master's in information technology. Maybe to begin our conversation, it would be great to explore your background a little bit and your pathway into science. Um, sure. And uh, when you play it back like that, um, I realise that I have explored three of the four letters in STEM as part of my career. But um, And perhaps we can unpack that uh, a little bit later because I have opinions with a capital O about that. Um, but uh, to, to wind all the way back, um, I think the thing to kick off with is by saying that um, it's not like I ever woke up and had a vocation around having a career in this space. Um, I grew up in a, in a family that was really um, very quantitative uh, and very um, technologically and scientifically oriented. You know, I frequently say that my, my dad taught me to solder and sew and my mum taught me to cook and code. Uh, and um, for me, one of the most significant left-right moments was um, uh, I hit adulthood during the recession in the 1990s. Uh, and so the choice that faced me at the time was uh, essentially to do a, um, a series of uh, not great jobs with, um, without much um, career prospect or do a PhD. And so I chose the PhD, but it's it, like it really was in opposition to the other choices as opposed to uh, an active, I really desperately want to do this. Um, and uh, the thing that I've discovered along the way is that what brings me great satisfaction is finding and solving great big complicated problems to solve. Um, and I, over the years I've been looking for bigger and bigger problems to solve and the thing that I have discovered brings me joy is creating space for people to do amazing things. So uh, I started uh, my uh, research career um, uh, in um, the gravitational wave field, so trying to build um, a global multi-decadal engineering and scientific task to try to build detectors that would measure um, gravitational waves, which were Einstein's last um, theoretical prediction, and then moved on to a, a different um, a grand global challenge, which was around um, building quantum computers. So that's kind of characterised the, the scientific endeavour that I've been on, um, and over the years um, I've worked with a range of people for whom science, technology, engineering, maths, all of that sort of stuff. It's just like a tiny, tiny slice of their world. Um, and understanding that and really getting into that kind of um, empathy space and understanding uh, how our world connects with much, much bigger worlds has been something that's been genuinely fascinating as I've gone along. And you, you joined CSIRO in 2021. What, what has been your experience so far in your role and what are some of the strategic initiatives that we should look out for? <laughs> so I joined um, an organisation with a national footprint. So f at that point, about five and a half thousand people with more than 50 sites spread across Australia, which is a very large continent. I joined an organisation with a national footprint during the lockdown phase, the phase of a pandemic. Um, so my experience was very much about learning my whole new world through what felt like a like the pinhole of um, Zoom and Teams meetings, like it really did. Uh, so it was a it was a um, I think it's fair to say an interesting induction into a whole new organisation. Um, and I guess the thing that that's left me with is uh, a sense that um, you know I'm pretty advanced in my career now. Um, I've got lots and lots of skills about learning 
um, my way into collections of human beings. Um, I do wonder about people who, for whom their first job was joining organisations during lockdown um, and what that means in terms of how you learn the people around you, how you learn the, the, the social mores of the work that you're doing. Um, so that was a, that was a, um, quite a dislocating experience to some extent, but I will say that um, even so, it, I was surprised at how easy it is to actually learn, learn the zeitgeist of a place through Zoom and Teams and that sort of stuff. So personal experience, kind of, kind of a bit dislocating. Um, in terms of joining the organisation, um, the thing that I have been really, really struck by is um, this is a place that people come to work because they are driven by a sense of purpose. Like there is genuinely a really strong sense that we are the National Science Agency and we are here to make a better world um, through the work that we, we do. Um, and that that is like it feels different to work. I, I've been working in universities for 25 years. It feels different to universities in that sense because um, we believe in long, patient, large um, research agendas where teams, people do stuff over a long period of time to make really profound long term um, insights and change. Uh, and for someone like me, who's motivated by finding and solving great big, hard, complicated problems, what's not to love about that? Exactly. Incredibly exciting. And I, I know as part of the, the new set of strategic initiatives, you, you, the, the term used is impact science, and mm. you know, how then science and technology can impact and benefit society and advance society, which is you know, exhilarating to be, to be part of that translational pathway. Oh, it, it absolutely is. And... Um, I mean, one of the fundamental differences uh, that I've experienced coming in straight away is that people really do design their research agenda with that with that impact in mind. So, so people actually throw themselves into the future and imagine a future world, and they work backwards from that to work out what's the place where we could be making the most significant difference. What are the really significant um, uh, questions that need to be answered, and let's target our research there. Um, which is not to diminish in any way the work that, that happens in um, industry or in universities. It's, it's just it's a different part of, of that ecosystem. Uh, and having come from universities where um, really you're, you're, you're trying to solve um, big, profound questions that will advance the, the frontiers of knowledge in your research, um, research area, um, you come at finding the good, good quality problems from a completely different direction. And um, we'll maybe come back to Syro and, and some of the work being done, done there, but just to touch on, on other work that, it, that you've done or your, your, your other uh, passion through science is that you, you've been committed to growing the profile of STEM in the community and also attracting a more diverse cohort of people to take up careers in STEM and draw on STEM schools. So how do you think Australia STEM is doing in this respect? Um, yeah, wow. There's a lot. There's a lot in that. Um, <laughs> Big question. Uh, it is. Yeah. So, um, don't let me forget to, to to come back to how my take on how Australia is doing. But I guess um, one of the things to, to unpack there is um, a little bit about why I'm so passionate about that, and also um, some of the the like you actually use the turn of phrase um, careers using STEM skills as opposed to STEM careers, um, and to me that. There is, a, there is an important distinction there uh, in the sense that uh, it all comes back to the why. And for me, the reason I'm so passionate about all of this is um, because uh, our world these days is so, so thoroughly um, shaped by our experience of um, the technology that we make. And, um, and sometimes it's been shaped by the experience of technology we made 50, 150, 200 years ago, if you think in terms of climate change and things like that, right? So um, uh, there is a profound sense at the moment that we are living in a world where there are really, really big things going on. Um, and it does feel a little bit like I get, I get this sense that there's a zeitgeist that sort of feels like, well, we kind of can't shape. People are feeling a lack of sense of agency about shaping the things that are going on. Um, and there are these big profound forces, and so many of them are related to scientific insights, technological inventions, engineering, that sort of stuff. One of the things about um, getting back to a sense of agency is about, if you think in terms of 
you know, what is agency? Roboticists think of agency as, well, you, you sense the world around you, you make sense of the world around you, so you reason on it, and then you act to do something about it. And I think collectively we've kind of all worked out, like we are sensing the world around us and we're working out that we're sitting on top of these grand ocean currents. Um, we've made sense of them in the sense that we don't like where it's going, but not as much yet about how we would um, uh, make interventions to change it. And the thing, is, the thing there is that we are going to need people with um, all sorts of skills, political, economic and scientific, engineering, technological and mathematical, to actually make the, to work out what the interventions are. So it's part of getting back a sense of agency to some extent. Um, and, that, and some of that is about people who have careers in STEM, but some of that is about having careers in um, completely other fields where you're making use of those um, insights and those STEM skills in order to reason on the world around you and um, understand what, what would be a set of interventions that would help us move in a particular direction. So that, like, what sits underneath why I'm so passionate about that is um, like it's subtle. It's not just the usual, you know, I, you know, I believe that these things are important and therefore we just need to, to have more people who are like me. Um, so, so there's that piece. Uh, in terms of how Australia is doing at the moment, um, look, the answer is not great, I'll, I'll say. Um, so if you look at most of the statistics about um, the, the, the qualifications that people are getting at the moment, um, uh, in Australia or in the university system, uh, the number of people who have been uh, taking IT qualifications, for example, has only the number of domestic students taking IT qualifications in Australia only last year caught up with the number that it was in 2002. So, you know, wow. Um, and uh, the number of domestic Australians taking engineering qualifications has been flat for the last 30 odd years. Uh, and um, while the number of people who've been taking science particularly science qualifications, it's hard in the statistics to unpick science versus maths, but the people who've been taking science aggregated up has been going up, but it's like it's very unevenly distributed. So um, there are a few areas of science, particularly the health and biological sciences, where lots and lots of people have been going into it. Um, the rest of the sciences are not doing so well. Um, and what that means is that, uh, you know, if you think in terms of Australia having a deindustrialized economy, um, one, of the, one of the things that's going on there is that actually if we wanted to ever to re-industrialise, the pandemic showed us that perhaps um, being able to make things ourselves might be a helpful thing. Um, uh, if we ever wanted to re-industrialise, uh, we, we don't have uh, people who actually have that set of skills, or at least not very many. Um, and what's more, we don't have a particularly diverse group of people who are who have that set of skills, which means that you know, all of the all of the research that speaks to the idea that um, uh, you get more creativity, you get a different set of um, things being made and imagined. If you have a more widely distributed group of people who who have that imagination, um, so so we have a declining total number. And what's more, it's not really got much diverse, much more diverse over the last thirty odd years. So um, there's lots and lots of work to be done in Australia, and um, my take would be actually these, the, like the, these declining numbers, um, the declining diversity is contributing to our sense of lack of agency. Uh, and um, you know, I'm a I'm a big fan of um, taking charge of our own destiny, and I you know, that's one of the reasons why I'm so keen to see so many, um, and so many more, and so many more different people um, engaging in this not just in STEM careers, but at least with enough um, STEM insights and STEM skills to be able to engage uh, and take charge of our own destiny for ourselves. Mm, exactly. Uh, I think what's you know, based in the UK and maybe taking more UK, European perspective on, on STEM and dare I say post-Brexit, you know, there's, there's been, uh, uh, unfortunately, the current government is excluding, for example, arts and its contribution towards science and technology and the diversity there in terms of the subject area, but also that there's a, a lack of encouragement of gender diversity um, and ethnic diversity in STEM careers, which will, will mean that the shortfall, for example, in UK currently in, in engineers, there's just not enough engineers to deliver on what's required, uh, that, that will just decline 
rapidly over time and will not be fulfilled. So we're, we're experiencing the same things, but I think what's great about Australia is that we have... You, you have you have leadership positions like yourself. We, we've had Carly Walker on the program. We've had Mark Hutchison talking about the importance of uh, uh, Aboriginal and Torres, Island, Torres Strait Islanders and their, their, their cultural con- contribution towards science and technology, which is great. Um, but it, it doesn't seem to be that, you know, yet filtering down to, to the numbers that you've just, just shared with us. Um, so... It's obviously a long, a long-term strategy, but you know, I think what's great is there's fantastic leadership within. It appears to me, from the outside looking in to Australia, there seems to be great leadership. Um, so, what what more do you think could your government do to support? Yeah, look, I mean, so so you're absolutely right that um, like there are a lot of voices talking about these issues at the moment. Um, and that's changed like really radically just it, just in the last five to ten years. Like it's become such a such a topic of discussion. Uh, and I will say that one of the things that like has really changed in Australia just in the last little while has been um, a growing can-do attitude. Like like we actually do seem to feel like this is we, we've spotted the problems, and actually now we want to step in and actually take a take a stab at doing something about it, um, which is actually really quite different. Um, and I, again, I can only put it down to kind of the clarifying power of the pandemic because it just made everything come real in a really short period of time as opposed to sort of, you know, I have a, I have a um, often used theory that, that, uh, that, that human beings are great at fast-moving crises and not so great at slow-moving crises. Um, and the pandemic just kind of made everything move really fast and clarified a bunch of stuff. So, like, there really does seem to be a will in Australia at the moment to, to just roll our sleeves up and get some stuff done. Um, but that's not to say that, like, this is easy, right? So, so as you've, as you've said, um, there are so many dimensions of diversity to think about, um, and uh, they are all incredibly important, and Australia has a lot of work to do um, uh, you know, we've been talking about gender for longer than some of the other dimensions of diversity, but we have a lot of work to do around um, people who um, come from uh, regional, remote areas. So, so in Australia, um, we have we, we have a lot of conversations around that. So, um, in addition to um, uh, re, um, socioeconomic background and whether whether or not you're Torres Strait uh, Islander or, or Aboriginal, um, and uh, all of those things are important, and um, we have a long way to go on that. And uh, being a loose confederation of states and territories also makes things really incredibly complicated. So, um, there's when we're looking for systemic interventions, one of the there are a lot of reviews going on at the moment. Our, our current Commonwealth government has is relatively new, and they've stepped back and they've said, okay, well, we need to actually climb back up onto the balcony and take a look at the whole dance floor. Um, and see where see how things have been travelling, and see where some some sensible intervention, systemic interventions might reside. Um, th- those are underway, and um, the fabulous thing at the moment is I'm, I'm keeping my finger on the pulse of a number of the uh, the the responses that are coming into those reviews, and like there are a lot of people out there with a lot of ideas, um, and it's like I, I don't envy the the review teams who have to um, work their way through and say okay well out of like all this huge set of really interesting ideas, which are the ones that we're actually going to pick. Um, but certainly, certainly uh, the, the, the one thing that I would add over the top of a lot of those conversations would be, um, I read this really interesting book um, several years ago. It was written in the 1970s by a sociologist who was actually looking at educational outcomes in the UK. Uh, and the UK has has a, a language for some of this stuff that we don't have in Australia. So the UK still talks in terms of class. Um, and this particular book um, reframed the question completely. And um, this sociologist was looking at, uh, in the 1970s, looking at kids going to school, um, and they were working class kids. And so he was asking, he flipped the question around, and instead of asking, well, so why do middle class kids... Um, uh, push working class kids into working class jobs. He asked the question, why do working class kids choose working class jobs? 
Um, and it's a very different way of thinking about it. And yes. coming at it from that direction, people in my world spend a lot of time thinking about leaky pipelines um, and, okay, people are leaving STEM and all of that sort of stuff. But it doesn't allow, that way of thinking about it doesn't allow you to think about where are they going to and what might you do to get them back. Uh, and so, so my, my, the thing I would be encouraging people to think about would be to come at it from the other direction and say, well, so why are people choosing lives and careers that are so completely devoid of STEM insights, STEM skills? And that's a very, very different set of questions than how do we just stop a leaky pipeline? Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's, that's such a fantastic point. That's not heard enough is, yes, we, we know about the, you know, the, 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 the drain from, from STEM careers and, you know, uh, but the, 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 there's no focus really to get those people back into STEM and to find the reasons why they left in the first place. But, you know, many of the reasons we, we know around academia and the challenges around academia and academic career pathways, but getting them back surely must be a strategic priority for, for every government currently, rather than starting right at the very beginning, you know, trying to feed the pipeline that will take, you know, 10, 20 years. Uh, it just makes so much sense what, what okay. you're saying. Um, yeah, I think we, yeah, in, my, in my take, we would need, we need to do both, right? We need interventions early on, but um, th as you say, they're they're going to take decades to play out. Um, what, what are the what are the immediate interventions that would have much shorter term uh, impact as well? And that has to be about lateral career moves, lateral life moves, uh, and thinking thinking really thoughtfully about yes. that, um, and uh, thinking about it. Uh, from a from a very subtle perspective that speaks to motivation and why people have already actively chosen not to do this. And we're, we're talking about you know the the challenges and opportunities around you know uh, technology translating into science into in society and the work the impact science work that Sire is currently doing. Uh, so I think we need to talk about science communications and, and also uh, open science. And so what, what are your views on, on science communications and open science? Um, and, you know, again, how is Australia doing? I know Cathy <laughs> Foley is doing a fantastic job, certainly, again, communicating from the top in terms of the new uh, open access policy. But, uh, yeah, t t tell me a little more about your, your view on science communications and open science. Well, so it would be a very um, not interesting conversation if I said I thought that were great. Um, so <laughs> pack that just a little bit more. Um, so uh, I guess, I guess again, one of the things that the history of technology tells us is that um, technology goes to scale and goes viral when a society is ready for it, not the other way around. And so we really do need to, and, and society is not just about individuals, it's about our collective behaviour and our collective understanding and our mutual reinforcing behaviour. So um, uh, th there's, there's two things to think about there. One is um, how, how might technology shape our society as well as how might our society shape the technology that we make, um, which again goes back to like the whole diversity thing. Um, so they're like, there are two forces op op acting in opposite directions and like they're in dialogue all the time. So clearly um, science communication uh, is, is central to um, both um, the way that people will receive technology and the way that they will um, think about um, scientific insights and the way that they will view the world, um, as well as uh, it's, it's a way of um, having a greater pool of people start to set a zeitgeist and set a sense about, well, so what is the science we're going to do? What is the technology we're going to make? How are we going to hold the people, the engineers who create these things to account? Uh, and so, um, you know, a live conversation at the moment is all of the discussion around um, large language models and chat GPT and all of that sort of thing. And um, like that, that has, for someone like me, I've been going to boardrooms and giving seminars and giving TEDx talks for years about how all of this is going to play out and um, how we need to be starting to pay attention. But until ChatGPT kind of landed late last year and 
Um, everybody had a relatively straightforward user interface and everyone could sign up and you could muck around with it and see how it went. It's like, for most people, it's come as a bit of a surprise. And suddenly, now, people are talking about regulating AI, people are talking about slowing down, building large language models and foundational models and all of that sort of stuff. So um, without quality science communications right now, that conversation can go in some really funky directions, right? So, so we might um, try, people might overreact and make um, uh, legislation that um, seems like it's gonna take, give us charge back, but actually it might intervene in the wrong places. It might um, make no influence whatsoever. It might just drive behavior underground. You know, it, you know there's, there's a range of ways where we, um, uh, and, and people and legislators may well be responding to um, not unreasonable concerns coming from the general populace. And so the more we have science communicators out there who are able to translate really, really complicated and subtle ideas into um, uh, factually correct um, uh, sets of conversations, we just need that. And like, that's just one example, right? I mean, climate change is an, um, like a really important one. We had similar issues during the pandemic, like it's, it's everywhere. Um, and in this world, particularly this fragmented world where people gather information um, through uh, um, social media and they, they believe that they're doing um, their own research when actually all they're doing is getting fed stuff from their, their, their own echo chamber, then we need to be um, having trusted voices out there talking about these things. And um, it is, it's such a central part of actually keeping our society together. Um, yes. and keep us moving forward together. Um, and on the open science um, side of things, I mean, we can talk about open publishing, uh, we can talk about open access research, there's open science as well. Um, my, my take on this is that, um, uh, you know, there, this, and you're the expert in this area, but I mean, there's, there's some complicated stuff there in terms of, um, uh, if you're talking about open access publishing, where, where we shift the, the power and where we shift um, who has to pay for what. Um, but my take would be right now, uh, and in fact, Cathy has done, Cathy Foley has done a little bit of research on this, um, and Australia's Productivity Commission has done some research that says that small to medium enterprises can't afford to pay subscriptions to um, great big publishing houses, and if we want to get the latest scientific insights into um, all of the all of the business in Australia, um, in the, all of the business in the world, um, we need to make the um, the threshold for access as low as we possibly can, um, because at the moment we are generating far more science. My take would be that um, if you look at the explosion of publication at the moment and the explosion of academic research, um, we're producing far more scientific insights than the world has the capacity to absorb at the moment. So we need to um, give people as much opportunity to absorb those insights as we possibly can. Um, and of course, uh, Sarah has its own publishing arm. Um, and how much involvement have you got with on the on the publishing side? And how how are they advancing uh, open access publishing? Um, and so the CSIRO publishing arm uh, are, have actually been um, one of the uh, one of the leading thinkers in Australia actually about pivoting um, from uh, pay to pay to read to pay to publish. Uh, and so, so they've actually led the charge in Australia. They, they, they could see the global transition coming. They could see the global shift coming around scientific publishing. And they've led the charge in Australia about flipping over to, to open access. Um, and like it's, it's the dynamics there are going to play out in really interesting ways. Um, it's been, uh, so far as we can tell, CSIRO publishing may actually want be one of the few publishing houses in Australia that actually still um, is reasonably profitable. Um, but which also still holds on to um, the ethos because of, of being a scientific publisher. Because, again, um, particularly uh, now, um, publishing houses are become um, like they have it. They have a contribution to make to society. They are the custodians of yes. um, our our scientific memory. They are the custodians of um, the record of of, of um, fact. Right. So. Um, these these publishing houses globally are incredibly important to us um, as a, as a as a civilization going forward. And uh, the more that we can um, find new ways to have that relevant and engaged and um, continue uh, flourishing into the future, that's got to be better, better for all of us in the long run. Yeah. 
Well, the, I mean, the, the sort of the, uh, uh, the vernacular in using open, open access has been, I think, superseded now in, in a good way by talking about open science, within which open access is, is one mechanism, but you have open data and open source tools and methodologies, etc. And so, you know, I think what, what you know, some publishers are hoping will develop will be an ecosystem of data rather than publications and data that will include, yes, publications, books, journals, but data sets, uh, methodologies, protocols, etc., cetera, um, uh, and relate back again to uh, the original funders' objectives and then connect with the, the outcomes within society and the benefits to society. So those are sort of the, the, the grander vision for, for open science. But you know, I think the first step is you know, to transform from subscription-based, toll-based uh, publications to to open access, and then move forward from there. So, you know, clearly, Syro Publishing is doing that. Uh, and uh, again, you've got uh, your chief uh, science officer, you know, focused on on open access and transforming the the landscape in Australia. Yeah, um, and to to riff off that particular observation, you. Um, I've spotted the same trend that you describe in terms of the, the transition to open science more broadly. Um, and, you know, the interesting thing is that the, uh, the computer coding community has ha have had open, open source software for decades. Um, and, like, it's fascinating that, it, that um, the scientific community has now moved more towards, as you say, open, open access data, open access tools and software. Um, and... In the end, um, most people who do research, the thing that one of the things that motivates them is when their idea gets picked up by somebody else and gets used by someone else. And yes. so, it used to be about writing a writing a, a textual paper and have having people pick up those ideas and implement them themselves. But if you can now put data and software um, out there as well and have people build on that and use those ideas and use those insights, then most people like most people are actually really excited about that. Yes. Yeah. It, it is very exciting and from a you know I'm, I'm coming from a publisher's background um, but you know definitely it's 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 advanced in leaps and bounds and you know, as we were talking about you know COVID and the pandemic COVID and the pandemic has transformed the publishing industry uh, particularly we can talk at length about uh, you know other publishing models but just for example preprints have come to the fore during the pandemic because they were the the, the most immediate, quick way to share research that had immediate impact on treatment, management, and vaccine development, and that's that's been proven. And that again, that 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 foreshortening of the the development pathway that we saw through COVID. I mean, we're we're all, we're all thinking, well, if we could do that for COVID and create vaccines, why couldn't we have done it already for for Alzheimer's, for etc. So, I mean that. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a great stepping stepping point for for a scientist to to know that you know it can be done in a, a much shortened period of time and sharing data is is the right thing to to actually facilitate building on the scientific endeavor. Um, that's a whole big other conversation that would take up a huge amount of time. Um, so. Maybe just to, just to, to finish because we are running out of time, and then I appreciate it. You, uh, you're very you're busy, and but uh, what should we look out for from CSIRO, say over the ne the next year? What's what's sort of coming up that we uh, you know, we should be looking out for? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, uh, you you touched on it a little bit in the sense that CSIRO thinks in terms of of impact, um, and. Uh, we we are very much um, engaged with all of the big national conversations that are happening at the moment around um, uh, how science and technology might be able to have a positive impact on um, the big problems that Australia faces. You know things like climate change, the energy transition, um, a, uh, the the um, aging population, well-being, all of that sort of stuff. Um, and at the moment we are um, quite busily going through a process of saying, okay, well, so um, we, we have 
a lot of really good quality research going on across the whole of the organisation. Um, and rightly, we are um, asking people who are deeply embedded in their particular research area and their particular impacted domain to think, think their way through that. And we're going through the complexity of trying to work out how to, to ladder up one level to, to think in terms of um, intersecting systems of systems and how we might be able to make contributions and interventions at the intersection systems of systems level. So um, the main thing, like that sounds very abstract, but actually um, one of the things that we are really keen to do is to have an outsized um, impact on the world around us through the, through the research that we do. Uh, and uh, so, so one of the things that people should be looking out for is um, a series of interventions that we think might actually have a disproportionate impact. Um, one manifestation of that uh, is uh, CSIRO created its, um, its missions program uh, well before I started uh, and it's very very much around the idea of like the old moonshot missions and things like mm, that and yes. the sense that um, you know we, we, we're trying to set quantifiable clear targets like okay um, uh, an example of a mission would be the hydrogen mission where we're actually trying to figure out how we would get the cost of hydrogen down to some economically viable level um, and in order to make that happen you've got to bring a bunch of partners from um, a, very, a range of different industries to come together to talk about what's stopping them at the moment. You've got to get a bunch of scientists, very fundamental scientists as well as um, translational scientists and engineers and technologists all in a room together to say well so what actually, throw yourself into the future, what actually is stopping us from doing this and now let's just systematically tick our way through to make that happen. So there's a, there's a program of a lot of those going on at the moment and they range from hydrogen through to monitoring water quality in Australia, which is like, that's a big thing in Australia. Um, so there's, there's a range of those, there'll be more coming out um, and they will be pretty topical because um, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on at the moment. Um, my personal um, passion, um, I'm working, working my way through um, how we in CSIRO might be able to make some interventions that um, actually touches on a bunch of the stuff that, you, that we've been talking about around open science and how um, we might transform the way that, like ab absolutely transform the way that people do their science by reusing and ladder laddering up from each other's insights to, to keep going back to zero point every single time you want to run an experiment. Great. Uh, so uh, thank you so much, Eleanor, for your time. It's been a wonderful conversation. Um, uh, I will include links to... Uh, those initiatives and our discussion points in, in the, the podcast description. Uh, and of course, we maybe we'll, we'll come back in a year's time and see how things are, are doing. But for the moment, Helena, thank you so much for your time. Wish you all the best uh, and uh, take care. Thank you, Martin. It's been a genuine pleasure. Thank you.